you're good at what you do, you've worked the industry that you're in, and you decide to take the leap and open your own business. You made it through year one. You made it through year five. You're an 18, 20, 25-year mark. Age starts catching up. Looking for something different. I, or health. You see a lot of businesses True. advertised. Why? The why is important. And we're going to talk to our guests on the why. Why leads into a lot of stuff, True. by the way. Uh, health reasons. Change a career. Dead broke, got to go. <laughs> <laughs> but the, my point is, many of you are looking to do that, respectfully, but are in a position where, oh gosh, I'm not sure what my business evaluates for. I'm not even sure if I really watched my P's and Q's. I pulled in wages and I was able to get through paying Uncle Sam and keeping yep. my business afloat and my clients happy. Uh, I want to bring in Robert Allen from Acme Advisors and Brokers. Robert, are you hanging? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome, hey, welcome. to Wrench Nation. Yeah, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate you having me very much. Thank you. Isn't that the truth, though, Robert? Uh, one of the most important things that could take place in a business we're not quite prepared for, and that's the exit. I imagine you see a lot of interesting sort of, well, scenarios. I, 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 well, not only <laughs> scenarios, but heartbreaking situations that you know, okay, this is a deal that I know we can help and save, because that's yeah. what you, you, you're you about, Robert. Talk to us about what the regrets are first off when someone is selling a business. I'd like to tackle that. Not knowing anything, they sold it. What could they be sorry for after they sell it? Not on a numbers, not on a numbers side. Because we can always complain, I didn't get enough money, right. right? But more on a lifestyle side. How many people are unprepared for what they're actually going to do with their life when they do sell their business? Yeah, I mean, most most uh, entrepreneurs that sell their company um, don't really think about what comes next uh, until they're in the conversation. Um, unfortunately, it's not, it's not always talked about in business management circles and, um, you know, the, the human ego likes to preserve itself. So it likes to uh, think things are never going to end. And, uh, and everything has a cycle, right? So, um, so you know, a lot of stuff that comes. We we, have, we talk a lot about the next chapter, like uh, helping our clients navigate, um, painting a very clear picture of what comes next and what they're going to do next. Whether it's another business, uh, whether it's uh, investing or advising or coaching or um, just you know actually sunsetting and spending some time with the family and finally doing all the things that you wanted to do. Um, that you just never got around to. So um, it does take it does take some, you know, some uh, uh, refocusing, um, but it's really worthwhile. It helps you keep your eye on the ball um, when things get a little bit wobbly afterwards. Yeah, no, I mentioned this because I've personally talked to, over the years, many not just automotive, you know, operators and owners, but just business folks in general um, that had a sale transaction and they weren't, they were not prepared for what it is that their life's going to look like. And, you know, we're not talking about, all right, sales done. I'm going to go fishing every day. All right. Everyone assumes that I'm just going to relax and do everything that I ever wanted to do. And that's fine and dandy. But we're talking about how do you sell something? And then all of a sudden you're putting the brakes on and you go through this transition. Part of what you and Acme advisor and broker team do is you're guiding folks and we're going to get to the numbers a lot of you are chomping on the bits for numbers but i think lifestyle is critical because i think you'll agree robert if you if you have a business for sale and you get your sale price that's a win but if you're not prepared for the transition of what what the, are you going to operate a hot dog stand part-time to feel <laughs> like you're connected to commerce i mean that's a reality you offer that in your evaluation and and consult yeah, we, we we help we help individuals just understand you know how they might um, redistribute their time and, and attention afterwards. Um, yeah, and it's different for everybody. So um, 
some folks really are done and they're like, I really want nothing to do with it. But more more often than not, you know, uh, entrepreneurs want to stay busy. A lot of them uh, have, a, you know, they want to contribute to their legacy and they have philanthropic things they want to do. Uh, you know, some of them are just taking care, you know, taking care of their own business closer to uh, their own community and stuff like that at a, at a greater level. So it just depends. Yeah. No, and I, and I, like I said, I, I've talked to some some owners of businesses that then it's a pay it forward and that keeps them connected, which is awesome. But again, we have to bring that up. All right, now listen, I have a business, and you know, I don't I don't want to deal with brokers or coaches or consultants, and I want to sell my place wow. on my own. I, I just I can sell my house, I can sell my car. I've been in business since 1920. I can certainly sell my business. What is the problem with a for sale by owner? mindset when it comes to selling a business mm, yeah that's kind of a big question but uh as far as, as those go um you know you just have to understand that especially the times we live in right now um the the buyer side of transactions are becoming far more sophisticated um, and what I mean by that is there's actually courses that entrepreneurs can take on how to actually create what they call buy models, which help them understand and run a lot of the same tactics that like a private equity group or um, a large investment group would do, a consolidator typically referred to, as uh, would do um, in terms of looking at deals. And then they're looking at a lot of deals. So they actually have... Uh, business development groups to go out and try and shake the bushes. And uh, we even hear a lot nowadays where private equity groups are contacting <laughs> business owners directly. Um, I've, ha- I've had a few of those things. emails. I-, I will just tell you, Robert. Yes, I've seen that oh, yeah. in the last, uh, well, all uh, all things post-COVID related, I've seen an uptick where it, it would typically be mediated through a firm. Um, there's an email, we're after buying your business. Why, why do you see that happening now? Can we speak to the automotive sector? What, what, why is the automotive sector specifically right now seems to be on fire? What, what's the story there? Is it, is it it's super profitable? Yeah. Is it trajectory? What's going on with that sector? It's, you know, it's the old story of, you know, real estate, right? So location, 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 and then also um, uh, strategic um uh, beneficial add-ons or what they call tuck-ins um, for specific regions, like you know, a supplier may need a certain number of shops to do something in a specific area, or uh, a shop that can do this or that. Like we see, machine shops are really popular too as a as a type of business that gets sometimes packaged in those deals. Um, that's just an example, but um, there's a lot of like strategic just consolidation happening right now. And they want the best shops at the best locations, the best customers, and the best locations uh, to build out. And then they're turning around oftentimes those those groups, and if they're a, like a strategic buyer group, and then they're packaging those up and flipping them to the larger consolidator. So it's kind of like a double move. Um, so, yeah, it, it's uh, very popular right now. And and would you say that this is really – does real estate really – a game changer because that allows these consolidating groups to flip a business. I mean, I hate to use the word flip right. because it's so, it seems so insensitive, but it's an investment. How successful can a small shop operator be in selling his business without real estate? Um, he, he or she can be, uh, just they have to um, have extremely solid cash flow and they have to really have solid staff. Um, that's the other thing that I'm sure we'll touch on, but personnel, uh, capable personnel, um, key personnel, you know, shop managers and or, you know, solid uh, ATEX and stuff like that are really uh, valuable. <laughs> so if you can tell a story that you have that and they're willing to stay with the transition and be a part of uh, what comes next. Um, can I ask you, Robert, on that? that? Because that's so critical. Um, we know that when a business is sold, sometimes there's not only, you know, the transition of an owner shifting out, but there could be a shift of the team. The team's not happy. Can I ask you for some of that advice for those that are listening? How do you prepare a team 
if, if you've built up such loyalty with a with a great team in the back, how do you prepare a team that you're selling? Could you give us some insight? Because many many shops right now that are considering selling, that's top and center. Like, I'm worried they're all going to quit, and and especially for those that may carry some money. You know, they may take a couple bucks up front, and then they want to carry for five years to make a deal happen. How how do you approach uh, the team in a transition? Yeah, you have to be you have to um, be very you have to walk you know uh, a thin line there, a fine line there, because there's a time there's a time to bring those key personnel into the conversation uh, ahead of you know the deep dive with the buyer or the buyer group, and uh, what you you know what you hope to do in those conversations is to secure their uh, their, you know, their buy-in to what's about to happen, um, but then also incentivize them. Um, and so there's ways to do that, you know, financially from an equity standpoint. Um, there's, there's a few different things you can do to keep somebody involved and give them a sense of, you know, future vision in that project. It really comes down to what the buyer has in mind too. Um, so that kind of all goes back to, you know, who you decide you're going to sell your company to. Uh, I think that's one of the most important decisions you can make um, because it really has to, um, if you care about your employees and you care about your legacy, um, that selection is, it's everything. Um, you know, some people, you know, just want to cash out, um, but then there's, then there's what comes with that, and that's usually not a very good scenario for anybody. Um, yeah, it has so to be planned. To the, the, the buy-in yeah, on that. I, it's, a, yeah. it's almost like a marriage, I say, because because like we were mentioning earlier, uh, almost all all transactions now, all, pretty much nearly all transactions, the owners are carrying a piece of the action. I mean, they're they're banking a piece of the transaction for a period of time, and depending on how it, it's price and terms, right? So uh, price and then terms. Terms are all negotiable. Um, most things can be, most everything can be worked through if you have a willing buyer. Um, but, you know, the owner is going to probably be on for a period of time afterwards, too. They're not going to just immediately exit, usually. They're usually going to help um, steer the transition and then hand the, you know, the steering wheel over and then hop out <laughs> when the car gets to, you know, a decent speed. Uh, Understood. So. We've got a few minutes before the break. I've got to ask you another question. And if we can, moving forward, I'd like to focus on the smaller business that may not own real estate. I think the, a lot of folks that listen to the show, I mean, we, I'm not saying we don't have investor types with real estate portfolios and stuff, but the smaller business owner, uh, and, and you know, that's auto shop owner, but also includes any uh, uh, business, 50% of the agreed deals as a statistic that's out there um, never close the deal and make it to the finish line because of due diligence issues. And, and I, and I don't, I, th- we could probably talk about this for hours. You can give seminars on this, but could you give me one or two things? If one is listening right now about their business, that is imperative to get in line immediately so that they can get to the finish line. What yeah. is the one or I two mean, things you can tell us? The number one thing is be impeccable with your books. Right. I mean, that's, that's the kind of the, all, all answers. I mean, if uh, somebody's going to dive into the books and, the, you, you know, you have a valuation and you want to defend it at the table in the negotiation and also for the purpose of gaining finance um, for both the buyer and for yourself. Um, you know, the books have to tell the story that you're telling. Yeah, and I, I find that sometimes um, there's a couple of different stories <laughs> to the book uh, or books. It just shows that selling cannot be spontaneous to be successful. No, I, 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 I don't think so. It has to have historical facts yeah. behind that. Yeah, I want you guys to visit Acme Advisor, advisorsbrokers.com. Of course, we'll have that in the show notes. I want to bring Robert back after the break, and I actually want to go a little deeper, specifically on the automotive side, regarding what a percentage uh, of cost of goods is is uh, healthy, what a percentage of your cost in labor, uh, and, and maybe we dive into a few other line items, and then also talk about the multiplying net factor 
of what your business is producing by way of a net and what that could be worth. We're going to try to tackle that with the time we have remaining. Stay tuned, Ranch Nation. Welcome back, Ranch Nation. Always good to hang with you guys. We're talking about the topic uh, about selling your business, and your numbers are a little crooked. Uh, It's done you well, but the numbers aren't straight. In other words, they're not ready for a sale because maybe they're the numbers yeah. are kinked. Yeah, they're not ready to be reviewed. I mean, yet. you've reported taxes, yeah. you've done all those things legally that you should do, and you were fine. Uh, but specifically, I want to dive in deeper to the automotive sector. I have a lot of shop owners listening to the show, and we've got Robert Allen uh, with Acme Business Brokers. Uh, give us a website, Robert. Acme, it's acmeadvisorsbrokers.com. Okay, great. Again, we'll have that in the show links. All right, I want to get in the nitty gritty. I've got five. Uh, automotive startups over the last 25 years that I've sold success- successfully, and it didn't it didn't happen uh, where I decided a touchy feelsy I'm going to sell. It was from day one, grow it, build it, a culture, keep it profitable, and keep it sell worthy. And some of the metrics that I want to get into is the cost of goods, particularly in parts. Uh, a lot of places, and I still to this day, I'll go through some non-disclosures. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm not going to mention them on air. And I, I'm looking. I look at businesses all the time in my sector, and I see a parts GP of 30 and 40 percent, where you should be getting 52 percent gross profit on parts. I'm going to continue, Robert, and you can chime in in a minute. Labor, you should be leading a light, a labor dollar hour should not be what the temperature feels good on the day that you open your business, but what is sustainable to pay people well, sustain low turnover, and pay yourself a profit. There's no shame in profit. And that labor should be 70 to 72%. So when you are as a business owner, I'm speaking to automotive shop owners, you're designing your business, that labor rate should indicate what it takes to get to 72-ish percent labor gross profit and 50-52% on the gross profit. It's going to give you a mix in general. If you add those, divide by two, 62%. Now, some of my European shops, uh, your your part number is lower. Uh, For some reason, you feel like you can't be more expensive than what the dealer is. I I don't buy into that. I think your business should be uh, priced out to pay people well, promote a culture, keep you alive in year eight, year nine, year 10 through the downturns, and ultimately, no shame in the game, how do I exit out? That is, in a nutshell, a basic formula. There are other line items. There's probably a good 20 to 30 line items, and I will just invite you, uh, reach out to either Robert Allen, Acme Advisors, Brokers.com, or myself on RanchNation.tv. Now, let's talk about this. Give me a scenario. You've walked into a business. They've reached out to you. And everyone after the end of the conversation, Robert, uh, it seemed like the clouds rolled in because this business owner had a business they thought was successful. And by all rights, they were successful. But the numbers were a little goofy. Can you tell me about how you go in with your team and dig deep Roll up sleeves to turn that around. Give me a case scenario. Well, yeah, we always, um, the first thing we always do is evaluation of the business. Um, and that you have to know where you're at to know um, what a realistic listing price is for a business. So that, that's usually the very first thing that has to happen. Uh, i got to interject. I have to, because that, that, that number seems to be a mystery. Um, I talked to a few shop owners, and, it, and it, it, it's gut-wrenching. They, they want to sell their business, but they don't even know what, how the formula, what. So can you talk to us a little bit about the net multiplier? That number seems to go around and people talk about it. What is a multiplier to a net as sort of a part of the formula that dictates what something could sell for? Talk to us about the net multiplier. Yeah, so I would I would say the first caveat to that is that you know value, business valuation uh, depends on <laughs> depends on the approach to the valuation, and there's uh, three major ones, but three major uh, 
ways to calculate the value. Um, but it's a little bit of science uh, based on uh, historical data, you know, uh, previous transaction data. A lot of that stuff is available now um, through big data resources. We use services that aggregate all that data and provide us the latest. Um, and then it's a little bit of art. You know, what story can we tell about the operations of the business? Um, the, uh, like, for example, one of the, one of the, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but one of the great stories you can tell about your business is recurring revenue. If you can find a way to look at the numbers and tell the story of recurring customer business and the profitability of that, that's future cash flow for a buyer. So, um, so that's a good story to tell. Um, so, you know, but uh, right now, just based on the latest data, I, I did check before we, the, the call tonight. Um, last quarter, the across the nation for the sector of automotive repair is at 285 times free cash flow. So you'll hear folks talk about EBITDA, but EBITDA is not, it's, it's it's the standardized terminology they use now for free cash flow. We like to use when you're talking about businesses that are less than a million or at about a million. We, we call it SDE or seller's discretionary cash flow or seller's discretionary earnings, and that's the amount that gets timed by that 2.85. And the average business last quarter in the automotive sector sold for around four hundred thousand dollars. So that's what they. That's so with, with that business. math, are you so with two point eight five? We're talking about a business that may have cash flowed a hundred and twenty ish thousand plus the pennies on the dollar for equipment plus the name, the website, all those things that sort of lead up to that end price. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Usually inventory is figured separately, so that's. That's a calculation taken at the very end, and the buyer will purchase your inventory at that time. So that's separate from what I just disclosed or talked about. But but everything else is you know could be folded and cannot be folded in. You know that, that's why I always say the two knobs are price and terms. Right? Somebody says, well, you know, uh, if you're not going to throw in real estate, but like let's say you know you have some equipment or something, you might throw it in to the sale, final sale price to get the deal done. Um, or you may not. You may hold it out and say you're paying extra for this. And that happens too. So. Yeah, I have found from my experience that equipment, and, and it's disappointing because equipment is expensive, um, equipment can almost be pennies on the dollar. In fact, I've seen businesses listed with uh, no net and a loss, and it's an inventory sale. But again, going back to your conversation earlier, it may be I'm okay with that as a buyer – was looking to expand a brand because that's a key location right. where mm -hmm. I'm not worried about inventory. And I'm sure you see those type of deals. Yeah. And some, sometimes it has to do with the way the financing is organized, like how the deals. Uh, it, so, for example, if somebody um, is using an SBA loan to make a purchase, those, those loan packages have to be uh, structured a certain way where, quote, unquote, goodwill or sometimes referred to as blue sky is uh, a certain percentage of the deal and allocated a certain way. So you got to move things around to get the deal across the finish line so the financing can be approved and everybody can move forward. So it really uh, depends. But that, that's why I come back to the, the fact that you got to have clean books. you got to have the best books you can have. You know? Right. So I think, I think as a strategy, it wouldn't – I mean, we do everything for our businesses, but as a strategy, I think we need to keep in our quiver the idea – that if we're going to live between two and a half to three times, then I need to focus on net. And again, I go back to this industry, which is the labor dollar. We lead by labor, mm -hmm. like gross profit from parts. That's cool. But full transparency, our profit is in labor. And by the way, pay your people well, which means you need to increase your labor, which then becomes value to the consumer. Many in the industry do not provide value. They're fearful of what they think they can charge because they're weak of value. Greg, you walk into a shop, you don't mind paying. But if you're not provided value, 
That's a problem. That's a big problem. And many consumers, it is a big, big misnomer. And I speak to the industry on this because I hear all these conversations about some sort of Oreo cookie pricing about, let's just put our finger in the air about what we should charge. <laughs> the consumer will pay. But you better have a business model that's dialed in. Your bathrooms better be clean. Your warranties better be tight. You better treat the ladies right. And then you can charge a labor rate that sustains positive vibes culture, paying people well, and the end result of what Robert Allen is talking about, which is a nice, clean net multiplier. And you can feel proud of that. Yeah, you're excited. And I see so many businesses that... um, and look, man, I'm speaking from Robert. I'm sorry I'm getting passionate, you know, and some of you no, think, right. uh, yeah, this is good my, listen, this my is first important. business, because you don't know any better. When you're 25, what do we know? Price. I love the people. I can <laughs> fix the car, but we just know price. We don't know what cash flow is about. We don't know how to structure uh, what our line item budget should be for uniforms <laughs> and things like that. Right. So that we can end up with a net multiplier or, or net in general uh, that, that's healthy. And so my first place was, okay, this guy is 70, that guy is 60, that gal's 20, <laughs> she's giving it away, whatever. I'm going to be $35.90. And you can't do that. And I speak to all of you individually, whatever it is you do, create value, work on that, grind the value, charge accordingly. Period. And I think uh, from a micro to a macro level, Robert, you've seen quite a few different scenarios. Of course, uh, multi-store, real estate, but so many small business owners, you have to admit they should not be fearful and take pride in providing value and charging what they should charge for. No, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a maturation process, right? Like you said, like when we first open up the doors of any business, you know, we we have a passion and an interest and, you know, we are the technician or the craftsman. And then we go through all the different stages of development and uh, eventually we become, you know, if we get to maturity, we become a business owner and we have systems and processes and operations and they understand all the different pockets of the business, uh, which nobody told us we were going to have to learn in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, uh, I got to ask you, Federal Reserve's current monetary policy is wonky. 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 I use the word wonky because that's a that's not an SAT word, but I like the word wonky because the last 20 years, it seemed like it was easy street, <laughs> at least from 2008. In other words, money was out there. You could acquire it. You could buy a house. Rates weren't crazy. Uh, you know, the economy seemed to be moving because we were on the Fed juice. There was a lot of money on the street. Now we have to pay for it, which means interest rates rise. How does this affect the current state of business loans, and specifically these SBA loans. If I'm selling my business, should I think about that sooner than later in regards to the current climate of these uh Yeah, yeah, you, you absolutely should. If you're, if you're actually looking at SBA, you need to get moving as quick as you can to um, understand the uh, increased complexity uh around 7A and, and uh, the different types of loans that are available for transactions. Um, there, a lot of the criteria has shifted. They just, um, last month, well, August, they raised the fees, the SBA fees on loans, and then now we have interest rates going up. So there's an adjusted chart of um, interest rates plus crime. All of that's on SBA.gov, and I, if you're interested in that, you should definitely look at it, and then you should absolutely get with a financial professional that could maybe pre-qualify your deal. And there are some really good lenders throughout the United States that are experts in SBA. And we're, we're, if somebody wants to go that path, um, we're pre-qualifying the deals now so that it's um, the, finan- the financial requirements are clear. And then when a buyer comes in, uh, it's like trying on a shoe, you know, like Cinderella. Either it fits or it doesn't. And, and uh and it's all pre-done so that there's not a lot of uh, drama around where's the money coming from and how it's going to work. Um, if that's the path that you're going to go with SBA. Now, if you're not, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways to the hoop, but SBA in particular, you know, it's definitely a different time right now. What advice would you have for a small business uh, that has a rock store right-hand man or woman that's been running 
the business as a manager. Uh, I work for Greg and his business. Him and I were tight for many years. He says, hey, I'm, I'm getting ready to retire out. I want to pass this business on to you. What should I be aware of regarding passing on the sale of a business to maybe one of the rock star employees? Well, so it's kind of a tough conversation, but it's an important conversation uh, is um, uh, the, the uh, heir apparent's capacity to endure the financing. Um, how will they, what, you know, when, uh, they're going to have to come to the table with some skin in the game. Otherwise there's not going to be, usually it's broken to thirds on, in an inside deal like that, um, where, um, they'll come with some cash. They'll have to get some, you know, um, money from the bank. And then, uh, you're probably going to have to carry a piece of it too. So, uh, the question is, how is that pie divided up? Um, you know, what is that amount they have to come to the table with? And then over what period of time, uh, you know, on your part of the loan, what's the interest rate going to be? All those things just need to be mapped out and collateralized. And certainly uh, I, but, I may want to add to that. There, It shouldn't be Greg should not leave me thinking as someone that ran the business on the front line. In other words, dealing with consumer client of whatever widget or service I provided. But Greg needs to make sure that he transitions the back back office cash flow mm -hmm. marketing ops and not do a hey I'm out of here in 30 days so you find a lot of those scenarios there needs to be a really agreed upon smooth landing to transition for success yeah yeah because that's the worst case scenario um, you know your, your first question about why people sometimes are unhappy with transactions uh, the worst case scenario is when you have to step back in. Yeah, I've seen I've seen this firsthand, um, you know, with uh, one of the deals that we had. Um, it was unfortunate, but I think I think one could say that it's important to have systems, processes in place, short of being a franchise, right, and ensuring that mm -hmm. that transition is understood under those systems and processes, uh, and it's not Frank goes pirate on what Greg built as a great system, and I decide I'm going to do it my way because I ran it. Do you find that often? You mm -hmm. find these employees that may buy a business and the failure comes from the fact that, well, I ran it for this owner guy or gal. I'm going to run it the way I do. And they, they don't realize that there was a quiet system in place that they were even following for years. And they go out of business. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot to um, how a business got to be sellable. You know, um, I think a lot of times uh, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on the business running itself um, for, I'm talking about in a strategic buying scenario where they, you know, they want to make sure it's not owner centric or owner dependent, but, but, you know, a big part of the secret sauce is the owner. And so um, how do you transfer that? that insight and wisdom and expertise, you know, I, I think the best way to do that is in a structured deal is to just make sure that the owner stays engaged for a period of time. Maybe it's right on the hip for a period of time, and then they slowly transition out and become like an advisor or a consultant because they have skin in the game still if they're carrying a piece of the business, if they're carrying a piece of the, the financing, right? Yeah, no, you that makes sure sense. make sure that the, yeah, the person succeeds. Real quick, we have just a, a quick uh, minute. I wanted to wrap up a story. I knew of a Greek restaurant. Greek owner, the guy would have everybody out there dancing out there in the parking lot and throwing plates and you'd pay $50 a plate to eat and you just forgot about pricing. And it was an experience that he built. And I always thought to myself, that is the business. He is the business. God forbid he passes away. What, what would happen? How, what, how? So there's a moral to this story. And the fact is they just, after he passed, sadly, great guy, very sadly passed away. The business went out of business. So I would add to the soup to nuts of setting up your business is to ensure you get out of the way and you delegate to those fine talents that are already in your business. I think business owners get in their own way, Greg. They, they, they have a tendency. No, I can't. This has always worked this way. I got to do it. And so if you're serious about selling your business, you need to allow the talents in your business to rise because... God forbid, 
Right. Something goes down. What's your family left with? So, so something uh, to consider. Uh, Acme and Advisors and Brokers is a matchmaker for sellers and buyers of businesses. I want you to get on to Acme Advisors, brokers.com. Robert Allen, I want to follow up in six months uh, in case interest rates get to some ungodly <laughs> number uh, over a hard refined beverage possibly hopefully not there's a fed pivot i guess maybe we'll see what happens there always an honor to catch up with you robert uh super proud of the great work you're doing and uh we appreciate you spending some time with wrench nation well thank you for having me frank i really appreciate your time thank you all right yeah. very appreciate it take care so all that right, i mean that's what it's about we got to be aware of that be aware of the plan be aware of the game you're in it but you got to step out and realize how that looks for the exit of your business. I know we didn't touch a whole lot of these further uh, points that we could go on and on about this. I remind you to get on acmeadvisorbrokers.com or reach out to me. I don't have the Holy Grail. Uh, we can set you up uh, with Robert. And if you have some basic questions, wrenchnation.tv. Good times, Greg. Thank you for hanging. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Sounds As good. I tell you every week, be safe, hug each other, and never forget to hug a mechanic.